Well, we should get started. Welcome to everybody. I'm glad you're here tonight. We're going to continue in Matthew 4 tonight where we were looking at Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. So you can turn there if you'd like. Um, appreciate you all participating in this study and, and as we go through and just look at some scenes from Jesus' life that d demonstrate his decision-making and, and his uh, insights, the choices he makes, the way he interacts with people, and try to, to bring out of that things that we can, can use. Uh, I think we have probably a few people here uh, from Brent's class. Um, I can tell you I, that Brent and I are extremely competitive about our classes. He does not want y'all coming into my class. I will tell you, my right, Elaine? He does not want that. But I will tell you, uh, I hope you'll stay. We're getting, we're, having, we're getting real Bible teaching here tonight. And certified defectors will receive an Amazon gift card as well. So come to me, and I'll make sure that you get that. Um, I do want to say, I do want to say in seriousness, I wanted to mention this tonight, that you probably heard that Ron Adams passed today. And I just wanted to say something. He was very special to me, and I wanted to say something about that, that uh, I remember there are certain people that when I'm teaching, and they come into my class and sit down, I'm intimidated by that. And I, it's certainly, when you see a person who's dedicated their life to teaching the Bible, and uh, there are people in, the, in this room right now that are like that to me a little bit. But Ron Adams, I remember him coming to a class of mine one time and thinking, and I was thinking, oh man, you know, I better be, I better come correct here. And he dispelled that in about 10 seconds. I would say there are very few people that have been more encouraging to me, taught me more than Ron Adams. Uh, humble person, excellent teacher, and uh, just loved him. And so I just wanted to mention, I know a lot of you feel the same way, but uh, he was uh, very encouraging to me and taught me a lot, and so I wanted to mention him specifically. All right, before we get in back into Matthew 4 tonight, let's bow and pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for all the blessings that we have. We're thankful for this time that we can be together in peace, that we can encourage each other, that we can study your word together. We're thankful that you've given us your word and that we are capable of understanding it and living by it. We are thankful for people like Ron Adams who humbly taught and was so encouraging to all of us. We are thankful more than anything for your son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for his life and his example and his sacrifice. We ask that as we study him, you would help us to understand what we can learn and that you would help us to be motivated every day to live like him. And we pray in his, in his name and amen. So last time we started in Matthew 4, and we, we transitioned into this... Uh, the scene where Jesus, after being baptized, goes out. And, and as I mentioned before, there's not a, not a lot uh, historically about Jesus written before these things. We have just a little bit, and I, I pointed out last time, um, and I, some of these things, I've been trying to use AI to come up with some kind of consistent type of images for this. This was created there, and uh, in fact, uh, Roland Jones came to me and showed me a picture of him when he was young, and it looked almost exactly like this. And so, uh, but Roland Jones used to be really good looking, by the way, so have him show you a picture. Um, and we really, we learned that he was born and how, and the events are surrounding his birth, and we uh, just have a little bit about that. We talked about him being presented at the temple. We have uh, just uh, that scene portrayed. He lived in a rural area. He, he lived uh, really in just a, a working society that we saw here. We uh, had the, the scene that we studied about him uh, prioritizing being in the temple and studying with the teachers and asking questions and learning there in the temple. We, we knew that he grew up, and we know that he, he worked in his family and that he grew up and learned uh, under his parents. I tried really hard to get AI to, to do a scene of uh, his baptism, and it did not go well. And so uh, if, you, if you ever tried to use it before, this was me making an attempt at it. For some reason, they came up with one where uh, he was being baptized by himself. Um, the other one, I thought, oh, this one will work. And then I noticed that uh, John the Baptist is wearing glasses. Um, I don't know why. Um, 
This one wasn't too bad. I just thought it was not, he wasn't dressed appropriately. No, this was him with glasses. This is John the Baptist with glasses. This one came up next. Um, I have no idea why there are two of him in this one. And I was just trying to really tune it in here, but this is, the gave me this one. Uh, then there's this one. There's an extra guy there as well. Um, and I don't know exactly why, but I totally failed on this one. But um, imagine that this was a really consistent image that would help us uh, in our visualization of this. This is, you know, uh, the scene that we're looking at tonight and the idea of Jesus going out into the wilderness. And it says in verse 1, he was led by the Spirit and he went into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted, that it was to be tempted. And it was to be tempted by the devil, that this was... Um, this was just a heavy weight bout in the wilderness. And I did want to read again Hebrews 4. We touched on it, and I just thought, I, I really feel like reading Hebrews 4 helps us understand the gravity of what he's doing here, that it says in verse 14, seeing that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so this was not the only temptations that he received, but the fact that he was doing this, and he was doing it uh, in such a difficult way, gives us this, this picture of Jesus being a high priest that can sympathize with our weaknesses. Do you remember what it says after that? First, before it, it says that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, and what does it say we should do as a result of that? Since we have a high priest that passed through the heavens, what should we do? Yeah, that's after. What does it say before? Hold fast your confession. So the first thing it says is, because we have that high priest, it should encourage you to hold your confession fast, that be confident about it. And then after it says, because we have him, that has been tempted in all ways, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace uh, to help in time of need. That this is the outcome of Jesus being our mediator and our high priest, is that the outcome is that we approach boldly because of it, because we know that he has been tempted and that he understands. I will admit that I uh, have grown up in, the, in a conservative church like this, and I'm not sure that's always the outcome for us. I'm not sure that when we look at Jesus and his life and what he did, that it creates boldness in us. Sometimes I think we live in a perpetual state of um, uh, caution or that we, are in, that we are in this perpetual state of worry even though one of the most frequently said things in the Bible is do not worry. But in this case, the reality of Jesus, the reality of what he encountered, the outcome is that we should have boldness before God because of it. Yes, sir. Uh, the ESV says yeah. Yeah, and that's really what we are missing sometimes, self-confidence, that we just think we're not good enough. We think we are just, we, we can't go to God because we are too sinful. We are not good enough. And I'm here to tell you, you are exactly right. You are not good enough. That we, and that's the whole point, that we come to him confidently anyway because of Jesus. So anyway, I just wanted to touch on that again because it's such an important factor in the fact that he endured this. And so we talked last time about the first thing that came up, which is that he, he was just extremely hungry. And it, the first temptation is that he should turn the stones into bread. And it says, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus' answer was what? It's a very quotable response. Yeah, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so he's really just pointing at what our sustenance comes from. We're surviving on God's word these physical things, this, the eating is not uh, the priority. So then uh, in verse 5, it says, And the devil uh, took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up 
and lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So he goes up and takes him uh, to the city, to the, to the temple. Probably 200 feet in the air was the, the highest point on this temple, just you know, way up there. And he said, throw yourself down. And then the devil does what? In order to convince him to throw himself off of this, what does the devil do? He, he says it, it is written. And he's trying to convince him by saying, uh, if you jump off this temple, what will happen based on Scripture? God will, yeah, he, God will not allow you to even scrape your foot. And he's, he's, he's saying that to him. Now, why is it interesting that the devil chooses this technique? Yes, sir. Yeah, even the temptation in the garden, we see him trying to, to persuade people and using God against them and using logic, you know, and in this case, he's using God's word. Anything else interesting about the technique? Yes, sir. Yeah, and so, in, so he does go to him, and he's kind of, he, he is it's a true temptation. That is, that he's saying to him, uh, you know, can you pull this off? Are you capable almost? And, and pointing to the fact that he's the son of God to say, God's not going to let this happen. Prove it. Yes. Yeah, what's the, um, what's the phrase, in every lie there's a shred of truth, and you know, that is, that, that it reinforces the lie to use a little truth. And it really, in this case to me, he is using Scripture as a weapon here. He is using Scripture in order to try to accomplish dastardly deeds, and so he is using this as a weapon. I, and I will tell you, I, I feel like we have all experienced people who are not lovers of God using Scripture. Do you ever see that? people who don't really care anything about the Bible, quoting the Bible? What's the one most, what's the most quoted Bible passage by people who are not of God? Yeah, it is, it is, I, and it always happens where you might say something disapproving to a person, and they're like, hey, judge not, lest you be judged, and their attempt is to use the Bible against us, use it as a weapon, uh, to enable them. And so I feel like that's a, that really is what's going on here is that he, uh, he knows this and he's using it to try to convince Jesus that it's in the Bible, prove it. And I'm sorry, yes, please. Yeah, let's give credit. It is skillful. It is to say, okay, it is written. You know, if that's what we're going to use as our basis, then let's, let's go there. And, and let's, let's be honest that, you know, the religious world is full of people who have twisted Scripture to do evil things. Uh, you look uh, in the history of religion back to the Dark Ages and, and medieval times, and they are some of the most uh, evil terrible people. The religious leaders are some of the most terrible people who ever lived, but doing things that is twisting God's word and twisting God's plan. And so the fact that he wants to, he came back with, okay, you said it is written. I'll give you some, it is written. And then Jesus answered him. And what did Jesus say? It is also written and that, it's important that he comes back with that and says, okay, you have, you have said something that is written but it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so this is, a, you know, this is really him now being an excellent uh, handler of the truth that he now can come back and say, okay, God did say that. He believes it is true, but you don't test that. That's not something that you waste time testing. 
And it makes you feel like that what was going on here is that there was a, that the devil wanted a spectacle, that there was an attempt here to, to maybe create a spectacle that, you know, turning stones to bread is one thing, but then him coming off of the, the top of a temple and angels come and saving him would be an event, would be, would be something that would be a show. And so that's, I can tell you that something happening against God's will that's a spectacle uh, does a lot of damage. Uh, you know, you look through, you see a lot of people who are um, religious leaders go down in shameful ways that are disgraced. Uh, you see people who are, you know, purportedly doing good, who you find out are um, con men. And those types of things um, do great damage to the truth. And the devil was just attempting to find the way to do the most damage uh, to Jesus and to the truth of God. So Jesus said, it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then in verse 8, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. So the first question I would ask is, did the devil have the capability of giving any of these things? <laughs> did he have the capability of giving this? I think so. I, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's somewhat of a philosophical question, I suspect. But he's, what does he offer him? He says the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he would do it if Jesus did what? Bowed down and worshipped him. Um, an argument could be made that a path to gaining all of the kingdoms of the world is worshiping Satan, that if, if that's the, the guide of your life. Yes? I just wanted to know, even if he did have the ability to do that, I mean, why wouldn't he? He would have already gotten what he wanted. Yeah, uh, Dariel said, you know, it, logically, even if, if Jesus uh, did bow down and worship him, why would he have to give him anything? It's one of those things where it's like, you know, if I give you what you want, then, you know, then what do I have? You know, you've got nothing else to gain. And so it may be that there was nothing to gain except he just wanted to find a way to convince Jesus to bow down and worship him. You know, so an argument can be made that uh, the devil is the king of this world and these earthly things, but I don't know how that works. I just know that he offered it to him um, and in an attempt to uh, persuade him to bow down and worship him. And clearly the devil thought this would be enticing to Jesus, that he thought that this is something that might be good. Now, how is it possible that the devil granting Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world and their splendor might appeal to Jesus? I'm not saying it did, but it, why would that appeal to him? Yes, sir? Yeah, I mean, I think it really comes down to the idea that he's offering him these things without what was required, what he was going to go through. And so the idea of the cross and the, uh, the pain and agony of that is the path that he's on to gain the, the universe. But to get the world, maybe there's this simple, there's this simple task. Brooke, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like maybe, maybe this was something that, you know, this was a really great thing to rule, a great thing to own for him. Yes, please. Yeah, it really, it, it, it's a short circuit. It, it's, it's like it's the, 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 the crown without the cross idea. That it's, it, that, and so, you know, I, I thought about um, the, the deal or no deal. Did you all ever watch Deal or No Deal? Uh, where you basically open a briefcase and you get what's in there or you keep going, you know? And, and the, you know, the, it's a really interesting study just from the math of it all. But you're like, okay, I've got $100,000. Uh, I've got that case. I can, you know, I can get offered something for that or I can keep going. And there's always this thing that says, do I take what's easy in the hand or do I keep going? There's the idea of the get rich quick scheme that you may know people, you know, there may be people in this room who have followed some of these where something seems 
uh, like it's a really good deal and maybe you're going to invest in something that seems like it's a big win, but you, it maybe seems too good to be true. And there are people who try to skip the work. They try to go straight to the, the, the win without doing the work. And that's just so rare if impossible. Yes, Vanessa. Uh, that's a trick. It is a trick. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't, he, so she, and she, if you didn't hear, she said that, you know, the idea of the kingdoms of the world and their splendor is power. It's, you know, there's, you know, obviously monetary value, but the reality is it's offering something greater than that, which is power. And she pointed out that Jesus uh, was in, you know, he is God. He has all the power. And so what did this, what did this offer him? And so maybe that tells us a little more about what Jesus said next. Uh, before he said, it is written, it's the next said, you know, what did he say this time before it is written? He said, get away from me, Satan. Get out of here. <clears throat> For it is written, <clears throat> worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He came back to an extremely simple principle. He didn't have to go through all of these, you know, all of these gyrations about, okay, well, you know, maybe you really can't give these things to me, or maybe they're not as valuable as me having what God is offering, or maybe, you know, I do have a lot to, he didn't have to go through all that. He came down to a one very simple concept, which is what? You do not worship anyone but God. I don't have to think about anything else. I will not worship you. And you get the impression from Jesus' response, you can't offer anything. There's nothing you can offer that will persuade me to worship someone besides the one true God. But I do think, I, I read a lot into what he said first when he said, I'm away from me, Satan. It's just, he ended it. I'm done with you. And I feel like almost, and I, and I want to talk about the next sentence here too before we continue, but I feel like this is, there's a lesson there by itself that at some point, you just, you stop messing around and you're done with this. I'm not, and I feel like Jesus was almost at the point where he said, okay, we've, got, we've done this, you, you had your play and it failed, but I'm, now get away from me. And we're gonna talk in a minute, I'm gonna go through some of the principles that I think we've studied here. I'm gonna ask you that question in a minute. Are there times where you're dealing with a person or dealing with a situation and you just have to, to walk away from it or you need that person or that situation just to get away from you and you're done working on it? That seems like, and I, I'm reading a lot into those, uh, those four words, but Jesus, you know, and there's an exclamation point, <laughs> that Jesus was adamantly saying, I'm done with you, get away from me, I'm not doing this, I'm not going to worship anyone but God. And so the devil left. What does that tell you about what the devil thought? Was there still a chance? Do you think that, they, you know, that maybe give it one more shot or maybe come in with the haymaker here at the end? Yes, sir. And, and I think I, you have to keep reminding ourselves that Jesus lived you know, he was 30 years old. He lived the, the first 30 years being tempted. He will live the next three still being tempted. This is not the end of what the devil's going to do, but he's leaving for now. And such an amazing thing that it says after that, the angels came and attended to him. Um, we see this supernatural moment here the impression I get is that Jesus didn't ask them to come <clears throat> and attend to him necessarily. That it wasn't that he said, okay, I finished guys, y'all can come pamper me. Um, I think about uh, Luke 22, about him in the garden, what it says. In fact, let's, I want to read that verse. I thought it was good. I think it's Luke 22, 43. Um, in 42, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. And nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. That, that 
It doesn't, it doesn't ever say that he called an angel to help him, but one was sent, and an angel came and, and attended to him. And just the idea that it says here, this idea of attending to him, um, I almost interpret that as uh, fed him. <laughs> I, I mean, I, what he needed. Um, I don't know exactly what that means, but it does seem to indicate that he had accomplished this. He was tired and hungry and struggling and I'm sure emotional, and an angel came and, and took care of it, and took care of this situation. So it's such a, to me, such a poignant thing. Yes, sir. It reminds me of what happened to Elijah after he runs, after, after the battle with the prophets of Baal, and he's just exhausted. You know, he's running, 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 and he finally stops, and, and, and the angel attends him. and gives him sustenance, and then he sleeps again. The angel comes back and gives him more. I mean, Well, and, and he's taking care of his people, and you know, I don't know how it works. I, I, I could never understand it, but it, it seems that God attends to the titans of faith, that he is going to make sure that um, what, need, what the needs are are taken care of. And so I just thought that was such a poignant way to end this scene, that Jesus accomplished it, sent the devil away, and then was taken care of by God. So I'd like to talk just for a few minutes about what we learned from this. Is there anything about this story as we see him going in and fasting and being tempted and interacting with the devil and the way he responded? What are some principles here that we see that are useful to us as uh, fallible humans? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, so we <laughs> he didn't have much to offer, um, but we yeah you brought up James we we alluded to that last time that the that the recognition and I think that's one thing to learn is the recognition that in enduring a trial is part of God's plan and that when we endure a trial that there is an outcome from that. And, and it is really how we're made that when we are tested, when we are tempted, when we go through trials, we come out of it more mature. We come out of it stronger. Um, it, you know, and that's why it should bring us joy, that we know that it's going to increase our endurance against more trials and temptations. Um, when we're young and haven't experienced things, uh, we're impatient. We have very low pain tolerance. I'm not, when I say we, obviously that does not apply to me, but people who are young, that's the way it is. But the older you get, the more, the more you learn. Yes, please. How big a temptation is it? Yeah. Is this really a temptation? Yeah. He really already had all authority. He really had, oh, if he wasn't even going to stub a toe, yeah. why did he even need to die on the cross? Yeah. The angels were going to come down. Yeah. Okay, it's very easy for me to say, this is Jesus. How easy for him. He knew where he came from. I've never been to heaven to see it. But what sort of sets it up for me is the very beginning when I have to remember Jesus is in human form. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he was in a weak mindset. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
you know your level of weakness. And I, I thought hangry would be said zero times tonight, and it was said three times. So <laughs> congrats on that. So, um, but yes, the idea there of we, he was, he, we have to, but we have to recognize even every scene we see of Jesus, he is interacting like a human being. And, and there are times in which he uses God's power, but it is not to um, reinforce himself. And so I think it's really important for us to see that he was feeling and interacting and dealing with the same type of frailties that, that other humans do. Yes, please. Yeah. It's encouraging to me to see the way he defended. That he defended in a level-headed way. He didn't ramble on with a debate, with, with having to give a big explanation. He went straight to, it is written, and he went straight to these, these very powerful points. And I feel like we, I want to keep pointing out that he keeps bringing up these priority scriptures. Like that last one, you know, it, the last scripture he just pointed out, it's like there's no, there's no way to prioritize something above worshiping God. Um, you might offer me something, but it, it's not going to overcome that. Dave, did you have your hand up? Believe him. And understands how powerful a point that is to say, being the son of God, look what you have at your disposal. And so I, it's such an interesting point that he, that's that same thing. If you're the son of God, well, then look what you can do. And so I think it's a really important point for us to see that the devil certainly didn't stop here. He certainly didn't uh, stop tempting him. He did all the way to the very end. And, and I'd like to point out, so back, you know, I, I want to point out to something I think is so important about what we learned from Jesus here about how he responded with Scripture, that I like to point out that the tools that he used to defend against these temptations are the exact same tools we have available to us. He did not use any special tools. I used to make fun of myself when I, I watched um, This Old House um, or, um, you know, uh, what was Norm Abrams' show? Uh, New, New, New Yankee Workshop. Yeah, and I watched those shows, and he would go in and he would like, okay, we're going to do this today. And he had this, I mean, the, his, you know, workshop was ridiculous. And he was just going there and he had all this like vacuum sawdust and, and a planer. And I had like, you know, I had Black & Decker tools and my workbench. And I sit and watch these shows and I have the thought, well, sure, I could build a rocking chair if I had that workshop. Of course, I could do it if I had those tools. And I, everyone here knows that that's not true. But I thought that. I can't do it with my tools, but I've, it's so encouraging me to see that what Jesus did here is he defended using the exact same toolkit that we have. He did not do it by uh, using some miraculous gift to, to send Satan away. He used God's word to do that. Okay, other things you might mention that, that we learn from this. Yes, ma'am. Because even when the devil started to try to quote as if he knew part of the Bible, but he misconstrued it, 
Mm -hmm. So this reminds me of the scripture in Jude that talks about how men who've been amongst us, but these are godless men, right? And I think that's the piece that we need to understand that if we don't have the tools mm -hmm. to discern what is correct and what is not correct biblically, right, then we would be tempted to go in a wrong way that we think is the correct way. And so I think... Yeah. Well, he knew who he was. He knew what he stood for. He knew his principles. And he wasn't looking for someone to talk him out of them or to convince him otherwise. I, um, I am hopelessly addicted to documentaries. And um, a large percentage of them are cult documentaries. That, that, that's, I think, the largest percentage of ones made. And they're all the exact same story. I mean, am I the only one who's watched these? The, they all the exact same story. A person, you know, seem, you know, kind of a plucky religious guy is kind of like starting off and then gets the people to listen and then uh, starts getting a little crazy and then money gets involved and then there's all, this, all craziness. But it is always, well, I, I shouldn't say always, very often those who are following a false teacher are people who are broken endured great trauma, seeking, it is weakness, and, and they are being taken advantage of. Their weakness is being taken advantage of. It is, it is um, diabolical, the way that a person gets power and is willing to take advantage of people who have endured trauma and mental illness and weakness. It is some of the most evil that there is. Obviously, it is the devil. It is the devil finding weak people and, and stealing them. And so in the case of Jesus, Jesus was, you know, it almost made himself weak. Had, even in his weakest condition, still understood, and I think this is a lesson to understood the principles of what he was about, what he stood for, and wasn't going to change those decisions based on uh, getting some bread. That wasn't enough and nothing was going to convince them. Yes, Don. Where uh, Jesus said, Be gone, Satan. And I agree with what Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 23. Get thee behind me, Satan. And the valuable lesson for us is we just need to stay the same. And we don't need to lean to the world. You don't play around with it. You know, it's the, it's, let's, not, let's not tiptoe around it. Uh, let's, uh, let's get a, far away from it as we can. One other thing I just want to mention, and before our time is up, that I do believe that there is great power in the preparation that Jesus did. I think that him fasting was not an attempt to weaken himself in any way. I suspect that him fasting was preparation. Uh, he prayed and fasted and did, these were the things he did to make sure that he was in as thoughtful a spiritual condition as he could be. He did what was required to prepare for this, and his entire life perhaps was a preparation for it. Yes, sir. Yeah, so they, these were two people who knew each other well uh, in this battle. You know, and, and, and I think we see a lot of the Satan lying, and uh, and I would say we certainly just finished a season, which you know, of political propaganda. You know, and so you know, I was getting phone calls six times a day. You probably were too, and texts and TV commercials. And I think there's a lesson here to learn that you don't don't listen to the propaganda. Don't listen to the get-rich-quick scheme. Don't listen to a person who has not demonstrated trustworthiness convincing you to do something. Don't, don't listen to a person who is a reputation for giving false promises and make decisions based on that. There, Jesus knew his adversary, knew his nature, knew he was a liar, and he didn't listen. He was not paying attention to, to the devil's schemes. So uh, next time, we'll, I'd, I'd like to 
continue, but I do want to talk a little bit next time, take some time to look at these three scenes that we've studied and think about what should we do as a result of that. And so I thought I might just give you some things to think about, and we'll discuss some of these next time and continue in these scenes. And so I wanted to you know, look at some of these principles of what Jesus does. And so the best, you know, the best answer to what would Jesus do is just say, what did Jesus do? And, and learn from that. So here are some things, you know, I thought about the first scene we saw with Jesus uh, in the temple. You know, what should we do when faced with a choice between two good things? Sometimes we get um, frozen. You know, sometimes I think we look at something and there's two good things to do, and sometimes we have trouble making that decision. How do we go about making a decision between going home with your parents or staying behind in the temple? What, do you, what, what should you do when dealing with people that are in authority that you think you may be smarter than? Or maybe, how do you deal with people that are in authority or anyone that you think you know better than them? How do you engage with that person when they have authority over you? Uh, what do you do when other people maybe are not as vigilant about spiritual things as you are? What do you do? How do you deal with people who maybe you don't think are as you know, vigilant and active spiritually as you are? How, do, how would you deal with them? Our second scene that we studied with Jesus' baptism, think about maybe the idea of how do you, what do you do when you're engaging with people that are outside of your comfort zone? Maybe when you're dealing with people that you think are not uh, in your bracket maybe or not in your clique. How do you, what do you do when you're dealing with people that are weaker than you or have more difficult life than you? How should you engage with that person? What about when you're asked to participate in something that seems like a waste of time? Now, Jesus, I'm not suggesting his baptism was a waste of time, but the cleansing, uh, the remission of sins was not something he needed, but he participated in it. And he made the decision, what, what are, maybe there are things that we could be asked to do that might, we might consider not a good use of our time. How do we make that decision? Uh, what about when there's an opportunity that arises to openly express your identity and who you are as a child of God? How do you embrace that situation? How do you handle that? <clears throat> tonight's, tonight's lesson in Matthew 4, um, what do you... What should you do when you're nervous about a challenge you see coming? When you, are, when you know something's coming up in your life that's challenging, what do you do? What about when you're questioned about what you believe? What about when somebody who maybe even has a good grasp of Scripture or somebody who maybe even is a religious person questions you about your faith and what you believe? How do you engage with that person? And then when you see an opportunity that seems too good to be true, when you see something, an opportunity that might save you a lot of effort or might seem too good to be true, <clears throat> how do you respond to that? And so I want to talk about some of those things in practical ways uh, next time, and uh, then we'll continue on in the study. So thank you very much for all your input tonight and your participation. I look forward to studying with you again on Sunday.